Welcome back to this latest episode of Japan's Top Business Interviews. I'm Greg Story. I'm the president of Dale Kani Training Tokyo, Japan. And my special guest today is Parissa Hagirian, lecturer, professor at Georgie at Sophia University. I asked Parissa to come on the program because it's going to be very interesting to get the academics take on what's going on in leadership because for us in business, we never get that deeply involved with someone else's business or company. We only have our own mm. little company view to look at things. But as an academic, you're looking across a broad range of issues around leadership, etc. So uh, looking at your research, what are some of the things that have popped out of you when you first started studying leadership in Japan? You thought, oh, that's quite different. Or, well, that sounds a bit challenging. Or when you've talked to companies, mm -hmm. they say, well, this is a big challenge for us in leadership. What are some of those things? Well, what I do is um, I've been researching Japanese management processes for really very many years, almost 20 years now. And um, what I mainly do is uh, look at interaction between Western or, let's say, European-American managers and Japanese managers. And of course, in Tokyo, this is very nice because there's lots of companies and leadership is, of course, a major topic. So um, just back up a little bit. So, yeah. you know, you said you've been doing this for 20 years. That's quite a long time. Mm. How did you How did you come into this field, you know, like you're an academic, so it's, you know, undergraduate, master's, PhD, yeah. publish your PhD thesis, that's the normal route, right? <laughs> yes. And then you, you have a speciality. So why Japan? Why Japanese management leadership? How did you get into that field? Yeah, well, I started uh, studying Japanese studies. That was my first degree. And um, I was interested in learning a difficult language. At the beginning, I didn't really know much about Japan. So I chose Japanese. Which, so, uh, on a minute. Well, most of us are trying to avoid <laughs> difficult languages. <laughs> yeah. why, why did you choose I to do a different language? I was 19 years old, I guess. And yeah, I really enjoyed learning Japanese. I still do. I still take lessons even after 30 years. And um, after that, I realized, okay, um, it might be a good idea to do something that is a bit more practical. And I also went to business school at the same time. So I have two degrees, Japanese studies and international business. I did a PhD at Vienna Business School. And after that, I got my first job in the south of Japan in Kyushu, where I worked for two years. And that was a very traditional place. Uh, where this is a teaching job? Yeah, this was an assistant professor job. Right. So okay. that was my first... Uh, this is what, Kyushu University? Or? No, it was in Kyushu Sangyo University in Fukuoka. And uh, a very traditional place at that time, and nobody spoke English. I was also the first foreign woman they hired. So I learned a lot. And it was very interesting to go there because I, I had a degree in Japanese. I had lived in Japan for three years when I was a student. I have research about it. So I thought, okay, I would be really well prepared to work in Japan. But when I actually started to work there, it was really quite challenging. And um, of course, at that time, I did not have a real leadership role. I started to teach, which basically is a leadership role. Of course, it's a bit different in the company. But what I learned really very quickly, and this is also something I observed in companies, is that the idea of leadership is fundamentally different in Japan. So people have a really very, very different idea of what a leader is, what a team is, how to behave in a team. Well, let's talk about those yes. things. What are, what are these ideals that you came across? Well, basically, if you look at the Western team, yeah, whether it's an American team or a European team, uh, one major point in a Western team is that work is divided. Yeah, So everyone has a different job, and often these jobs don't overlap. So they're very interdependent, and the leader job is to kind of... Um, manage these differences, different personalities, different jobs, and also have a more or less individual relationship often with each team member. Yeah? The orchestra so, conductor. Yes, for example. Is always yeah. a good analogy. <laughs> Some people good call metaphor. it like working in a zoo. That's what I also heard. Working yeah. as a zookeeper. <laughs> that's another basically, great yeah, metaphor. Yeah, so I love it that. depends on what way you look at it. But basically the idea in a Western team is that everyone, it's a, it's a, it's a group of individuals trying to achieve a goal together. And the team leader's job is to manage these differences and take care of all these differences. Yeah. In Japan, the overall idea of a team is really different. So a team is a team, it's a group that has a common goal. So the group has a goal as a whole. Yeah? We want to, I don't know, sell this, we want to improve, we want to enter market, whatever it is. And within the team, roles are very flexible. So people can do, anyone can do any job. If you talk to Japanese team leaders, they often tell me, oh, I can do any job of my team members. Every team member could be replaced by me because I've done it all, I know it all, and 
This is that this is that rotational exactly. system every two or three years. You're switching yes. departments, you're learning each part of the business. That's, that's lifetime employment, the classic model, right? Exactly. So basically you have managers moved around the company in different departments, but also within a team, usually all these work processes overlap. So I wouldn't say, okay, I'm only responsible. In Japanese teams, you don't say this one person is only responsible for let's say the homepage. Yeah. And this other person is responsible for, I don't know, marketing the product. But uh, everyone would do everything somehow. And people would be very well informed about what everyone's doing. So That's it's interesting very... though, Prisa, because when I look, you know, what I find with my own team mm. and most Japanese teams is they want a very finite definition of their job responsibilities. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I always make the joke, the ideal document Defining mm -hmm. a job responsibility scope yeah. in Japan would be written on the back of a postage stamp because they want to get it as absolutely tiny as possible so they have the least amount of accountability so they don't have to have any fear of Well, uh, of yeah, failure. I mean, the, the problem, if you are in a real Japanese team, yeah, the full team is accountable. So you're not accountable as an individual. Mm -hmm. yeah? If you're in a Western team, you are individually accountable mm -hmm. for whatever you do. Mm -hmm. And that's also written in your contract. It's communicated to every team member right from the beginning. Mm -hmm. Everyone knows what's going on. So for Japanese, working in a Western environment... Mm -hmm. This accountability is, of course, confusing. Yeah. yeah? So uh, having a, let's say, KPIs that you need to fulfill, being basically responsible for the whole process that you're in charge of. This is something that many Japanese, if they're socialized in a Japanese team before, do not really know. And of course, it's highly irritating if you do this. And if um, I do a lot of training for foreign companies in Japan, and this is one of the major problems. Yeah. So what you're saying is in a in the mm. Japanese company context. We're all responsible, so individually none of us are responsible well, is the basic yeah. philosophy. This is, this is how you could look at it, but from, from our Western perspective, this is very confusing. Yeah. Mm. I, I used to have a colleague who said, we're working in a fog. <laughs> it's never quite clear who is doing what and who is responsible for it. From our perspective, we are, we've been trained from a very early age to take responsibility for what we do, what we say, and mm -hmm. this is how it is. Yep. And here it's not quite clear, and that's very, very irritating. And that's, of course, irritating if you are a foreigner in Japan leading a team of people who have this attitude. That's one of the biggest issues. Yeah. The other way around is the same. A Japanese leader with foreign team members has similar problems because foreign team members tend to take all kinds of, uh, I don't know, responsibilities or constantly tell what they think. And this is not always so welcome in a Japanese team. So mm. there's very, very, very different views about how a team is led, what a team is about, how people should behave in a team, how team members share responsibilities. And that leads to a lot of challenges and often conflict. This yeah. is a very important topic in cross-cultural work. And I have to say, it's the same everywhere. No. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's not that... I mean, there's companies who managed it better. Uh, one thing I... Sorry, when you say it's the same yeah. everywhere, you mean everywhere in Japan? Well, in foreign companies in Japan, this foreign problem companies is in very Japan. evident. It's a common yeah. problem. It's a common words. problem, yes. Right. And, um, of course, uh, this mix of cultures uh, is always something refreshing, inspiring. But to manage it... It's really hard, yeah? People mm -hmm. always underestimate how difficult cross-country... Cross so country what's, the, what's the usual solution? Is the usual solution just be the sledgehammer and tell all the <laughs> Japanese to line up, okay, be accountable, here's your job description, you're going to hold you accountable for the results, yeah. get your numbers or hit the road jack type of thing? Is that basically they make the Japanese adjust to their system or well, is the, it changing? The biggest problem is in general that um, if let's say expatriates or foreign managers work in Japan, they are mm -hmm. not quite aware of these differences. It takes really a long mm -hmm. time to okay. find out. And mm -hmm. it's a learning by doing process. You make a mistake, this doesn't work, loads of frustration, and then you find out, oh, okay, maybe I should do something else. That's one thing. The, the other problem is, of course, that many of, especially foreign companies in Japan, they often have this attitude, we are, let's say, a German company, we're an American company, we have the system, and everyone who wants to work for us should know that. Which sounds easy, but if you're joining an American company or German company or whatever company in Japan, it's still the majority of people here are Japanese. They speak Japanese. We're in the middle of Tokyo. So it's not always very, very obvious that this is a foreign firm. So people actually bring their 
system or their thinking into this company and behave according to their cultural standards. And that's not really a surprise. Problem starts when you have headquarters or managers coming from overseas expecting something completely different. And I have to say, um, I've also seen this phenomenon in Europe. Uh, very many years ago, I was teaching uh, at a, a school in 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 Salzburg, a smaller place in Austria, where they have a big Sony plant, and the majority of students in this class were from Sony, and they insisted that Sony is an Austrian company, which it isn't, yeah? But there was never a Japanese person. Once in a while, somebody showed up from Japan. Everything was done the Austrian way. Everybody spoke German in the middle of Austria. So this is really a very normal thing to, to, to do if you're in your own country, you happen to work for a foreign firm, but then again, you are at home and things are like they are at home. But of course, yeah. this is a difference. It's, it's a problem if you want to manage a team that has a very different idea about leadership and teamwork than yourself. So in that sense, too, uh, you often hear, oh, our company in Japan has become very Japanese, yes. mm -hmm. right? You Which hear this expression, very Japanese, yeah. which means it's not complying with what headquarters wants yes. and they get rid of the president who's Japanese and then they fly in the foreigner yeah, for example. Who, two or three years, <laughs> right, yeah. to somehow make it less Japanese. So I guess this is the situation a lot of the people you're well, talking about it, encounter, it, right? It depends on what level you look at. Of course, there are foreign companies in Japan who have foreign standards, let's say, in terms of quality, in terms of production, because that's their business model. Yeah. If you want to sell a European or American quality here or an American brand, it should be an American brand. But this is different from what happens inside the firm and how teams are managed. Yeah. So there are two, two different levels. Yeah. Usually headquarters want... A subsidiary overseas to work yeah and to basically apply to very general rules what the brand's about what the quality is about what the production guidelines are that's it whether the team is led in a japanese or american or european way is not the most relevant factor as long as the results are okay. unless you're the yeah. leader <laughs> unless you're the leader and you're right in the middle of it and things get complicated this is of course basically the the, the very let's say micro perspective but from a headquarters view if this works yeah uh, they don't always care how it's done. Yeah. But if you are in this situation, there's a few things you really need to know, and it is extremely challenging. So, everyone so what are those things? Like if you sort of took this sort of hit list, you know, well, first Parisa's of all, top five hit okay, list, of so her, there's what do you got to understand about leading in Japan <laughs> there, that's different? Okay, so the, 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 there is a certain, let's say, a certain process. The first thing that you need to do is find out about your own leadership style, which is really difficult. Yeah? Because, of course, everyone believes my leadership style or the way I do things is the most normal thing ever. <laughs> yeah, I remember when I first came to Japan and people did things that I always thought, this will never work. But it worked really well. And I really had to learn that uh, the way I was brought up or the way I was socialized into a company was not uh, the only way. Yeah. So um, if you have... Well, a that's, a, that's a very vital point, yes. isn't it? Basically, there's, this is number one. There's more than one way yes. and to the mountaintop. Exactly. And there's also more than one successful way. This is also very important. So if I basically find out after a while that things don't work, it might be a question of different expectations. So I expect my team as a Westerner to work independently. I expect roles to be divided. I do not want people who get paid less, take over jobs of people who get paid more if they're, for example, ill or something. Yeah. So these things are, of course, an issue. I need to find out what my leadership style are. Is Usually this leadership style is very strongly culture related, or at least where you're socialized, your first job plays a really important role here. And my opinion is, if you don't really work hard, it's difficult to change. So step one would be finding out what your own leadership slip style is. Well, just keep on that point. What are what are some leadership styles that well, people would be basically, using? Basically, for example, as a leader, I work, I'm a team leader and I expect people to tell me if there's a problem. Okay. Yeah. So uh, in a Japanese team, this doesn't always happen. Yeah. My students, for example, they kind of arrange themselves and then come back with a result. And afterwards, I hear about problems. Yeah. And if it works out, it's fine. But if there is a problem that keeps going on and on, and I, I, I'm never informed. You're the last one yes, to find out. You find out too late. That's, of course, a problem. Mm. So I would say, and uh, I have a, a friend who's been living in Europe for a long time. She said, in Europe, people would always say, why didn't you say anything? 
Yeah. <laughs> and of course, in Japan, this is not always the first thing you do if there is a problem. You try to talk to team members, you try to find a solution. It's a more integrative process. That would be one example. Mm -hmm. yeah? What's another one? And it would also uh, be, uh, the other example would be, I, I give you something to do. Let's say, uh, Greg, you're in charge of the homepage now. I expect you to work on your own, come back a week later with the first result, and then we talk about this. Yeah? I'm not expecting that you come every hour to my office and want to clarify every detail because you want to make sure you're doing it right. Yeah? Mm -hmm. A Japanese leader would be very patient here and would say, okay, I'm expecting to be constantly involved. I always need to know what's going on. Yeah? And I don't want to know a week later after you've worked on your own for a week. So these differences are really very major mm -hmm. and they, of course, lead to a lot of conflict. So once you find out you have this leadership style that is, of course, not, let's say, 100% adequate to your current situation in Japan, mm. the next thing would be, so what kind of goals do I have in a team? So what, what goals does the team overall have? Should it be, um, I don't know, basically there's clear business goals, there are quantitative goals. Yeah, we want to increase sales, we want to enter a new market, whatever. But that could also be like qualitative goals. Yeah, mm -hmm. The team should have a, a better, um, a higher satisfaction with uh, work or people should get along better or whatever. So you can actually define these goals. Yeah, this is really very important. What should be at the end of this? Yeah, or what do I want to achieve with this? And after this, the most important thing is to find out, and this would be again a little bit of a Western approach, what kind of team members are in my team? Yeah, how do they work? How do they think? How do they feel? And then take it from here. For example, if you have, or my experiences with Japanese teams, I mean, I mainly work with student groups, it's much easier to motivate them if they do something together, yeah? Which isn't always the case with Westerners, yeah? They like to do the things on their own, preferably nowadays at home, yeah? Come back with a result, and they need this trust, yeah? Okay, you can do it, I believe you, and please come back with your, whatever you think is right, next week, yeah? In Japan, that's not always a good idea. People feel isolated. They don't like this. Yeah? And it's not that they can't do it. It's just they don't feel comfortable doing this. Mm -hmm. So if you know that, it might be much better to give the team one goal and everyone is responsible for that goal and the results will be better. I've done a lot of tests in the past years, um, mainly at university, but I have realized that in Japan, with a Japanese group, it, the, the results are better if I, I develop a team goal and everyone can contribute to this. Yeah? If I develop individual goals or let people compete with each other in a Japanese group, this, this did not always work. And this would, make, this would make foreign leaders nervous because our yes. system is, yes. okay, we've got the headquarters set target. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We then break that down mm -hmm. by division. Yeah. Then the divisions break it down by people. Yes. And so each... Each little Lego yeah, yeah, piece <laughs> interlocks with the other Lego pieces yeah, and adds yeah. up to mm, a final result, yeah. as opposed to something very fog-like that yeah, you yeah. mentioned before, working yeah. in a fog, where, okay, we're all responsible for this big piece of, uh, of a result here, and somehow we are going to do it with no individual accountability. Yes. Yes. I can't see too many Western leaders being very comfortable yes. with that. That's a really big problem, and it is not only that, that they're uncomfortable with it. People do not know these differences. Yeah, I, uh, I had a training uh, early this year in a Western company in Japan, a really old company. It's been in Japan for decades. And uh, I explained how headquarter works. And then one person who has worked there for 20 years thought, oh, I've always been so surprised why they can answer every mail so quickly. Yeah, uh, it must be because they can decide on their own. And I thought, yeah, that's the reason. But people in Japan, same company, never heard about this. They, they basically behaved very Japanese and took one or two days to answer an email because they, every time they get an email, yeah, they have to go back to their group, discuss everything in the group, come up with an answer and communicate it back to headquarters, which takes two days most of the time. And that's very, very difficult for headquarter people because if I'm a project manager in Europe or in the US, I have certain responsibilities, I have a budget, mm -hmm. I have decision-making power, I know what I can do. If somebody is called project manager in Japan, I do assume this person has exactly the same situation, which is not the case. This person is just called project manager, but is not allowed to make any decision on his or her own. Yeah? I'll tell you a funny story about urgent business. Mm -hmm. Years and years ago, when I was living in, in Brisbane, Australia, I went to, there was a thing on Japan and Australia business, and there was a guy there. He was uh, running a um, a stone mm. 
a stone business where they'd cut out stone, mm -hmm. huge blocks of stone and, and ship it off to Japan for construction site, that type of thing. And uh, this is back in the days before the internet, right? So everything's mm -hmm. fax. Mm -hmm. It's the old days. But he was amazed. He'd get these faxes from Japan and the faxes would have urgent yeah. stamped on the faxes. And he thought about that. He said, you know, I looked around my desk. Mm -hmm. I don't have any stamps with urgent on them, mm -hmm. but all these Japanese are putting urgent on the faxes for the orders because I've worked out that foreigners are not reliable. They're, they're, you know, they take too long, even though the decision making mm -hmm. is very fast. Mm -hmm. But here's the Japanese pushing them for instant communication, instant feedback, instant answer, urgent, urgent, urgent. Yet on their own, it's going to take them two days yeah. today to give you an answer. Well, so it's just uh, intriguing, it, it depends. It? it depends on what level of work you're talking about. A Japanese team is, of course, a lot slower than a Western team in making a decision or coming up with a mm -hmm. conclusion, but it's a lot faster than in implementation. Yeah? Yeah. Mm -hmm. It can kind of start right away. Once a decision is made, things happen right away. And in, in Europe, it's exactly the other way around or in the US. Yeah? You have fast decision making because one person can make a decision. But then again, you say, okay, let's do this. Usually resistance. Not invented here. Yes, syndrome, yeah. Right? And, or maybe even, I don't know, lawsuits, <laughs> whatever. Yeah? People are not really responding very positively, whatever. And that is taking longer. No? So these kind of differences also need to be taken into account. Mm. Japanese teams can be extremely effective because of that. But of course, the decision-making process is a lot longer, which is, mm. of course, from our perspective, since we're very used to individual decision-making, very difficult to understand. Mm. So if you want to lead successfully in a cross-cultural team, you need to go through these steps. First, analyze yourself. Next question is, what's the goal? Third, third point would be, okay, what kind of team members do I have? How do they work? How do... People don't change this easily. I mean, you can go, sit down and say, okay, look, this is an American company. We do it like this. You have this uh, responsibility. You're accountable for this and that. And people still don't feel it. They don't even know how to do it often. Yeah. So um, the next step and the final step would be to develop processes that accommodate people in the team and make sure they can perform it the best way they can. Yeah. Which could be developing new processes, yeah, thinking of something very creative, or um, adapting your expectations, your communication to the expectations of the team members. Yeah. So for example, if you find out that So what you're talking about there is you're you're mm -hmm. looking at people on the basis of the people in sitting in front of you, mm -hmm. you then build your expectations. Now in normally in a Western environment we don't make the job fit the person. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We make the person fit the job. And if you ever try to do it the other way around, in a Western environment, you're mm -hmm. going to hit resistance. No, no, no. We have a defined yeah. job. We need people to fit into that bucket. Yes. We are not going to change the job yeah. to suit you know, this person yeah. over here. So that's yes. quite a different way of yes. looking at it. Basically, in a Western firm, you have, it's a so-called uh, job company, a job-related company. The job is there first. I want to fill the job. I've tried to hire somebody who has expertise in this field, so I don't have to train them. I save a lot of money, and this person can start right away. In Japan, it's the other way around. I'm hired by the firm. I do the jobs that, are, that need to be done. And, and I'm trained. Yes, I'm trained and I'm also and I'm them. not only trained. In Japan people are really very flexible when it comes to doing new things, yeah? And I have a lot of these discussions especially in MBA classes between Japanese and non-Japanese managers saying okay, Sorry, what's an APA? An uh, MBA. In oh, MBA, MBA, sorry, MBA. In okay. MBA program uh, where the Japanese say this job rotation is really very good because we constantly learn new things, we find out what we like on the way and we know the company really well. Well, whereas Western managers would say, look, you will never be really good at anything if you do everything at the same yeah, time. You're generalist, yeah. So there's a very big uh, difference in what people find important. But at the end of the day, um, it is, of course, also beneficial for the company if you do not have too strong restrictions of what people are allowed to do. Yeah? A Japanese company really can use their members as human resource. Yeah? Yeah. And that's, of course, from a Japanese perspective, a very... Uh, uh, positive aspect of work. And this is also one of the reasons why Japanese companies do not have to fire people so yeah, easily because yeah. they can basically just they, put them somewhere And else. the people will yeah? accept that. The people will accept, yes. yeah. oh, uh, we're closing this division. Yeah. You're now going to work yes. in the gardening yes. section. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Well, basically, you're running export machinery one, before. Now you're in charge of gardening. Exactly, but yeah. the point is that in Japan also there is not so much of a judgment of what's a good job, what's a bad job, or high level. Or you know, this is every job is important, and this mm. is really how people see it. And mm. at the end of the day, somebody has to take out the garbage. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah so yeah, that's yeah. there's no judgment here, which is mm. of course different in a Western firm. And mm. also, one really important thing is that um, what I find is, for example, what my Japanese guides tell me that when they talk to Western the managers or managers in headquarters, one of the main answers is, I'm not responsible for this, yeah? which is extremely annoying from a Japanese point of view. Because in Japan, if you, even if this is not your job right here, you do feel responsible for everything. And you may find, hmm. try to find an answer or talk to the right people. Hmm. So these differences are, of course, there. And um, when, we, or when people cooperate in a team on a daily basis, it's, of course, extremely difficult to overcome these differences because people are wherever they are from, always convinced that their style is the best, yeah? Or the most normal, let's call it that. The most normal style is my style. My style yeah? is natural style, Yes, right? and uh, I'm not quite, I do not quite understand why others don't understand it and why isn't it obvious to them that it should be done like this. But what you can do, and I think the best way to deal with this, and it doesn't matter whether you look at it from a Western perspective or from a Japanese perspective, is to show people that it's always good to know two styles. Yeah? So mm. that's what I do also in the classroom because I teach Japanese management. That's my core course. And there's always the question, which style is better? Yeah? And there is no perfect style. No so each, that, each style it? has strong points and weak points, but what makes every manager better is to know two styles or more. Yeah, because the choices are bigger then. You have more choices to, to, to find solutions. Yeah? Mm. And the interesting thing about Japanese management is it really, it really provides very, very different answers to every management problem. Yeah? So if you've been working in Japan for a long time as a foreigner like me, you kind of have always the Japanese option and thinking, okay, I could do it this way. Maybe that works better. Yeah. So um, I, uh, this is the so-called contingency approach in management. You have a situation and you judge the situation. Every situation is unique and different. And after that, you decide, okay, do I take the Western route? Do I take the Japanese route? Do I take, I don't know, the Muslim route, whatever. But if I know different routes, I have more choices. And that's the way to look at it. Yeah. yeah what are some other, you've, you've talked about a couple of things which sort mm -hmm. of major differences. Any other particular major differences which spring to mind? Well, basically, the, the teamwork is one big topic, and the other one would, of course, be communication. Yeah. Okay, well, can you well, talk a little bit about the differences in communication? Yeah, communication is, of course, I mean, Japanese language is very polite and often much, let's say, group-oriented. Yeah, mm -hmm. You are more vague, you're not trying to uh, um, be, let's say, too specific. One thing we always have to keep in mind is that not only in Japan, in most Asian countries, communication is focusing on the listener. Yeah. So if I speak to you, I first think about, okay, uh, what's your position, what's your relationship with me, older, younger, man, woman, boss, non-boss, whatever, yeah? and then I adapt the way I speak to you. Oh, that's because of the Kago, right? Yes, the Kago is based upon yeah, language. Japan, Kago is, is basically the is symbol hierarchical. of that. Yes, Kago is the result of that, of this judgment. But I first look at the person I talk to, and then I adjust the way I speak. Kago I remember is just, I went yeah. to Georgia. I'm a graduate of Georgia. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> Uh, I did a master's degree yeah, in Georgia. Senpai, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Well, I did a master's <laughs> degree in uh, in uh, Georgia. Cox uh, was actually a Hikakabunka in comparative mm -hmm, culture. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I remember I had, for some reason, I had a meeting with a very um, older Japanese lady professor. Mm -hmm. And I was still just learning Japanese. Yeah. My Japanese wasn't very good. It was rough yeah. Japanese student yeah. Japanese. And I said something to her and she answered me in a very polite Japanese language with ice mm -hmm, just mm -hmm. dripping mm -hmm. off the words, you know. Mm -hmm. I obviously insulted her mm -hmm. by my familiar non-keigo, non-polite language methodology. And when I said something, because I, if I could put two words together at mm -hmm, that stage, mm -hmm. I was pretty happy. But her reaction, I immediately realized, uh-oh, I've said something the wrong way here, but I didn't know what it was. Yes, that's and I didn't know how to say it quickly. Example, yeah. But I, the reaction was like instant. Yeah, yeah. It was a very polite reaction, but man, it was yes. just cold as ice. But I mean, this is really very common for most Asian cultures. You do, when you speak, the focus is on the person you speak to. Whereas in most Western cultures, the focus of the speaker is on him or herself. Yeah. So I have this message for you. Yeah. I 
talk to you, I tell you what I think, which is very important in most Western cultures, and then you do whatever you like with it. Yeah, yeah? Yeah. So you can agree, disagree, you can like it or not like it. That's not my problem. Yeah. I just focus on what I have to say. Yep. And uh, most Western cultures are really very proud of this, yes? mm. freedom of speech, whatever. And of course, when people who have a, a, a speaker-focused communication style and people who have a listener-focused or s- recipient-focused communications that talk to each other this is also a big um, conflict point often yeah and in most companies it is and then on top of it most people like especially if they're not native americans uh the foreign manager and the japanese manager both speak a foreign language speak english so that makes it even more complicated but it is really very difficult to overcome these communication differences you know i often I often say to people okay imagine you're working in Europe or mm-hmm. America or Australia or wherever, and your uh, your Japanese manager turns up. They can't read English. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. They only speak to a few people in the company who can speak Japanese. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And think about that mm-hmm. position. Yeah. That's the foreigner. They can't read Japanese. Yeah. They can't read. Yes. They're illiterate in this country. They cannot yes. read yes. anything, basically. Yes. Maybe some hiragana when they're buying yeah. something in the supermarket, if this they're is... lucky. So they're illiterate. Yeah. And who do they speak to in the company? They speak to the few people who can speak good English. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, they have to do it through translation. Yes. When you flip it around like that, and people look at it from that perspective, imagine you're working for somebody who's a Japanese leader in your home country who could not read and could barely speak the language and think about, that's you. <laughs> that person yeah. is actually you exactly. here. Exactly. Yeah. That's so you've got exactly. to make a big yeah. mental adjustment there. Yeah. I mean, I doing. have. I have to say, I've met more foreigners in Japan who can't speak Japanese than Japanese managers, obviously, who can't speak English. But yes, it is a problem. Yeah. Um, I have a lot of students who do internships in 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 big multinational firms, and sometimes even the CEO comes up to a bilingual student and says, "So, what have they?" What did they say or what's going on? Yeah, because uh, it's very difficult to find out what is mm-hmm. going on. And then, of course, as a foreign CEO, you often, unless you speak really good Japanese or um, let's say if you're in a very modern or innovative industry, it's very difficult also to speak to clients. Yeah, mm-hmm. Many industries in Japan, successful industries are very traditional and uh, they do not really uh speak English often or don't want to yeah and uh, this is the uh, this is the reason why a lot of foreign companies have now started to hire Japanese CEOs because that w- that definitely makes a lot of things easier yeah mm. but um, well it make, makes it easier on this end yes but it doesn't make it easier on the other yes, end, which yes. is dealing with headquarters, exactly, right? Exactly, yeah. That's always yeah. a challenge because, of course, a, a Japanese manager or Japanese CEO of a foreign company here is usually in a very difficult position because on the one side, the expectations of the market of the Japanese company here is very clear and very Japanese. And then you have expectations uh, from headquarters, which are very different. It's often really challenging to accommodate. There's nothing inside. more, there's nothing more yeah. invigorating than trying to explain Japan to your foreign boss who's based outside of Japan. Yeah, that's one thing. I mean, uh, you know, usually foreign companies, as long as the business is doing okay, they don't interfere too much Mm. into their subsidiaries. Uh, But when they, for example, want to grow the business or change something or implement a new product, uh, they do expect, of course, the Japanese CEO to behave like a Western CEO and say, I can do this, I can do this, uh, let's not do this, and interact, let's say, in a very... Uh, yeah, in a very individual way. But mm. that's often not the case because, of course, even the Japanese CEO is considering himself or herself as a member of a bigger unit and is trying to be integrative. Yeah, So often the reaction is not as, let's say, um, <laughs> direct as it was Well, expected. the thing that's, uh, I think, surprising yeah. for a lot of people too is when you, you meet a Japanese president of mm. a big company, they don't have much power. You imagine the president is like the president of a big Western company, got mm. massive amounts of power, but the division heads in big companies have tremendous power in Japanese companies, and the president's sort of sitting above that, but they don't have that 
dictatorial capacity mm. to tell the division heads easily what to do. They have to get their cooperation. <laughs> so your expectation is more like a Western system. Are oh, they going to be driving the business? But yeah. that's really the case. I have to say it really very much depends on the company and how it's set up. Mm-hmm. But one thing is often uh, an issue in, uh, in foreign subsidiaries in Japan. There is often a lot of people who've worked there for many years, let's mm-hmm. say 20 years or longer. And if there is let's say, a new CEO, even if this, especially if this person is Japanese, this person is not having often also the emotional power to deal with all these members who've been there very long. Yeah. yeah. And um, this is, uh, this is of course, something that a Western company doesn't often realize. Yeah. Mm. You, you may find a suitable person and put this person in charge of a, of a foreign subsidiary, but then there is this people, department heads or whoever who've been there 20, 30 years, they are they have real emotional power in the in the company as well. Mm. And, and they've got all this loyalty. Yes, they have all this loyalty. The, they're the patron. And they're well known. Of all and these people below they, them as they well. They feel yeah? this power too. Mm. So mm. these people are difficult to manage. Yeah. yeah? And um, as Yogi, a, Yogi Berra, that mm. well-known American philosopher, oh, okay. said it well. <laughs> he said that... Uh, Leading is easy. Yeah, okay. Mm. Getting people to follow you is difficult. And yeah. that's the classic case. Okay, you're the leader. Yeah. But in that Japanese context, uh, okay, I'm the leader, but I can't order people around like a Canon or Western company. Well, I have to get people to follow me. Yeah. I've got to somehow get the group behind me. It's a, it's a yeah. very difficult It's task. often very difficult to manage all these things, yeah? Mm. And, of course, from the headquarters perspective, this person is in charge yeah, but yeah. in What's Japan, the problem? The, yes, tell them what yes, to do. That's exactly the point. <laughs> but here it's not so easy. And of course, um, I know. I mean, people always. You see, when when I did cross cultural management in business school ages ago, this was seen as a really soft topic. Yeah, and people were saying, yeah, everyone speaks English, and now we have Skype or whatever, or we can video conference. But in fact, you know, uh, it is becoming more complicated because the more people from different cultures work together, the more evident differences become and you have to deal with them. And it's it's really a topic that in the past years, companies have realized that ignoring it is really very costly and we yeah. create a lot of um, competitive disadvantage. But it's not only about what happens inside the firm. Another aspect, of course, would be how to deal with the market, how to deal with yeah. customers that yeah. are not your home country customers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah? So these things also need to be taken into account. And if you want to be successful in a market that you emotionally do not understand, yeah. you have to have a good team or let's say a team that you trust and that can actually give you the feedback or the information that you need in this market. And that's where it all becomes very complicated. If you do not have this really good relationship with your team or your team doesn't believe uh, that you're a good leader or whatever, uh, then it's really very complicated. And uh, cross-cultural conflict and differences are on top of that make it even more difficult. And it's not, yeah. it's, not, it's not beyond the possibility that you're sent into Japan mm. as a change agent. Yeah. And I mean, what happens? Exactly. I you mean, start yeah. pushing the changes. And what do those entrenched Japanese interests do, suddenly the board is getting communication about you, Mm. that you're destroying the business, you're upsetting customers. The point is that um, I I, I don't think this is is always the reaction. No, it's not. But I'm saying it's not – don't be naive – Japanese who've been in these companies for a long time, yeah, yeah. they know how to work the system. Yeah, I know, I know. But one thing is also clear that if you're a Western manager, yeah, you are hired to, um, you hired as a person and you have to constantly prove the company that you were hired for a good reason. So one thing is very important that in any position in a Western firm, you have to promote yourself. You constantly have to tell people, look, I'm the right person for the job because, mm. and that's the difference to a Japanese firm, power can be very easily taken away in the West. Yeah? Mm. A Japanese person who's been a manager for 20 years has really gained a lot of emotional respect, has a lot of emotional historical power mm. almost, whereas in the West, this can be done gone within a minute. Yeah. So what do you do as a Western manager? You show how important power you are. Got, yeah. And basically, and this is really a bit of a Western obsession, you implement change, mm. yeah? often unneeded change. Mm. Yeah. And this is also one thing that I hear in Japanese 
subsidiaries a lot. So, oh, there's this, two ma this new manager for three years. Now we have to do this. And then after two years, he realizes that's not working and we go back to zero. And then the next guy comes and it starts all Star over again. Starts Yeah. So you yeah. see, I mean, often I don't think that people always react as negatively as you just said. But, no, I'm um, not saying they don't uh, do that commonly. I'm just yes. saying that if you push too hard, don't expect those entrenched interests to sit there and take no, it. No, yeah, but I, mean, I think that's a very human reaction. But what is true is that, um, of course, you can. Um, and I mean, a Western manager or non-Japanese manager is often sent to Japan to to take care of standards that the home country mm -hmm. company has, which is totally normal. Yeah, it's fine, to do. Yeah. And this can be done on various levels. Let's say I have a production standard, I have a quality safety standard that needs to be kept, otherwise the business is not working. Yeah. That's fine. But then again, you know, when we talk about interaction between people, there is no real rule. Yeah? No, no one says that a Japanese subsidiary in Japan has to work like an American firm. Mm. This is just an idea. Mm. Yeah, mm. And uh, this can be changed. If you want to be successful as a leader, do the Leadership Training for Managers course. All companies need people who can both manage and lead. Leading people screams out for real skills in communication, dealing with all different types of people, being excellent at innovation, planning, delegation, handling mistakes, doing performance reviews really well, and inspiring and motivating the team. Do the Leadership Training for Managers course now in either Japanese or English. Are you doing business with Japan? Do you really know how things work? Japan Business Mastery provides the answers. Do you have the right networks and know how to create them? Do you know how to get on the same wavelength with Japanese buyers? Do you know what being trustworthy looks like from the Japanese perspective? Japan Business Mastery is based on more than 30 years experience in Japan and will become your go-to guide. Want to succeed in Japan? Buy Japan Business Mastery now. Just on that, in terms of your, your research and talking yeah. to companies, you know, uh, when we look at uh, engagement scores in Japan, uh, I've certainly had this experience, you turn up in the hub, usually Singapore or Hong Kong, mm -hmm. and all of the country managers are there and they've got the screen there and they're putting up the global mm. results of the engagement survey. And then APAC is usually at the bottom. And then at the very, very bottom of APAC is Japan. And next thing you've got all this pressure on you about, well, what you're doing a crap job in Japan. Look at these engagement scores. But when you look across the board in mm. Japan of engagement scores, it's usually somewhere, it used to be around about 7% were highly engaged, and now it's down to probably 6 or 5% depending on the survey, but they're never high numbers. So in your, in your research, what have you found uh, that works well for getting engagement? Now, you could say that, and I often doubt whether these engagement surveys mm. are really suitable for an Asian yeah. audience. That's one thing. Yeah. Are the questions translated correctly? That's another question. Mm -hmm. And culturally, some of these questions don't make any sense. Yeah. For example, yeah. in Japan, would you recommend working in this company to your family and friends? Mm -hmm. Well, no Japanese is going to do that because culturally you don't want to take that responsibility. So you're going to give that a low score. So the survey drops the number down. Well, but don't worry about the mechanics. Yeah. Talk about what have you found that works well in general terms of getting engagement up? Well, I think the, the term engagement as such is already a really Western term. What does it really mean? Well, you can't, does it you mean can't that even I translate raise it. my hand or I raise my voice in a meeting or that I contradict my boss or that I take on a job like that? Mm. I mean, this is, a, this is already a problem. Most of these surveys, and this is definitely a problem with cross-cultural market research, whatever you do, whatever you investigate, is, of course, um, that many of the definitions you have are Western definitions. Yeah. So engagement is a definition that, for example, in Europe would not be a topic very well investigated either because um, what you look at is the result of people have a job assigned and can they do it or not or how do they do it that's it yeah so this is a very American idea and um, of course first of all you need to define what engagement really is so I can only imagine that I am very proactive in taking on jobs in a team that would be my interpretation as a European woman yeah I'm not quite sure if this is the interpretation that an American boss has or a Japanese person and then of course 
below that, you have the execution of these questionnaires and international surveys, which are often really very problematic. I, I, I know that because I did my PhD and I interviewed 4,000 companies worldwide and I think 800 Japanese firms. And I had a questionnaire that I worked on for almost a year and it was translated and then I sent it out and people sent me the corrected version back. There were still mistakes in it or misunderstandings. It was so much work and it's really very difficult to do that. So engagement is a question of what do I expect? Yeah. If I expect every one of my Japanese team members to go and come up with great ideas via brainstorming session, that might not work. But that's my, if this is my definition of engagement, it, I'm going to be disappointed. Yeah. But if I expect my Japanese team members to say, look, our goal has not been where they reached today. We need to put in another five hours extra work and we'll stay here until midnight and they will all stay. That's engagement from a Japanese perspective. Mm. And that might not be engagement from a European perspective or American perspective because you have to pay extra for it or it may kind of create some trouble with the union whatever so these kind of things are always a little bit difficult and again i have to say as a good international manager as a foreign manager in japan for example you need to know how to motivate people mm. yeah this is one thing you definitely need to find out so how do you motivate people how do you, how do you motivate people and in what japan works? My, my my impression is that people are much more motivated by doing things together and having a common goal together which is clearly communicated and allows them to work let's say in some ways freely to achieve this goal yeah um but uh that's something you need to know and the best way to find out is to ask yeah and you don't have to ask people right away saying like, hey, what motivates you? But you could actually <laughs> ask somebody, look, if I do this, do you think this is a good idea? Or how would a Japanese manager do that? If phrasing questions very, let's say, new, in a neutral way that you can actually find out what would work. Mm. I, I do that at, at, at the university as well. Of course, I, at Sofia University, I have very international students and even my Japanese students have been exposed to international schools or life very often but still it's a good question to ask and one of the main questions to ask is would you like to do this exercise alone or do, would you rather discuss this in a group and mostly the answer is we'd rather do it together yeah mm. and um, that's important to I mean if you take care of people people want to be seen and it doesn't matter whether they're Japanese or not but it, it's important to react to people's expectations some way you cannot change these expectations this is mm. not going to happen yeah so one of the the sort of necessities of getting innovation, creativity, mm -hmm. is that people are engaged. Because, you know, if you want a better mousetrap, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. first of all, people have to care that we should have a better mousetrap or not, right? So if they don't care, the good, bad, indifferent mousetrap, they're not going to help. So first of all, if you've got that engagement, then people have some interest in making things better around mm -hmm. here. So what have you found that's worked? What are companies doing that's particularly helpful around getting innovation, creative ideas. In Japan? Mm, yeah. Well, uh, in Japan, the classic crea creativity or innovation process would be, there's a few aspects. One um, aspect that is now also quite common in, in Western firms is that you have teams, uh, very different background, which is a lot easier in Japan because people have done so many different things in general. Yeah, So you can actually create, a, let's say, a, a development team out of very different people, which is much more difficult in the West mm -hmm. because all these egos are mm -hmm. colliding and that's not so easy. And also that, you've got those, well, I guess you've got those sort of, you know, uh, into Nicene mm. wars in Japan too between divisions. I guess it's the well, same thing, yeah, but, but maybe in the West it's a bit more yeah, intense. Yeah, in the maybe? West it's a lot more difficult because people stay in one division for 20 years, yeah? yeah? yeah. So they're more often more uh, connected or more emotionally connected to the division and to the firm. In Japan they're more connected to the firm, so that doesn't matter. That's one thing. And then what I find is often in Japan... Um, there is uh, many companies and very famous examples, yeah, where these teams start working with some kind of slogan or an idea, yeah? And a very basic idea, basically saying, we want to develop something that uh, has this main feature, yeah? And then start brainstorming ideas from there, or often using models, using games, these kind of things, yeah? And uh, technicality comes later. This is also a very important difference, yeah? In many Western, uh, especially innovation processes, uh, engineers play a very important role from the beginning, yeah? 
So how do we do this? Is this doable? Is this nice? Does this look nice? Is a very important question from the start. Whereas many Japanese teams, they play around with an idea for a while and then afterwards think about how could we actually do that. Mm. And uh, a lot of people think that Japanese teams, because they are formed or basically they function the way they we just discussed, cannot be creative. But of course, this is absolutely untrue. And Japan is one of the most creative countries in the world. And uh, Japanese culture is really very, very important cultural factor worldwide. Yeah? Mm -hmm. And uh, this creativity mm -hmm. comes from that idea. And then there's one more thing that I find really interesting in Japan is that um, if you have, let's say, somebody with a great idea, yeah, let's say I'm working in a company and I have this fantastic idea for a new product. Yeah, Usually in a Western country, you would try to protect this idea. You would work on it maybe secretly. You would try to get a patent. Skunk you would make work, sure right? Typical skunk work. You yeah. would try to make the most of it on your own. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So many ideas are developed individually. And this is, of course, also uh, very obvious. Let's say American companies are very good that you have all these famous entrepreneurs yeah, who have been doing this and who really believed in the ideas and pushed it and whatever. In Japan, many ideas are put on the group level right away which can be good or bad, yeah? Uh, so I have a small idea, let's say we want to change this product and I do not kind of think about it on my own for weeks and months, but I put this idea into our development team right away and then we take it from there and everyone adds a little bit and at the end of the day, nobody really knows whose idea it really was, yeah? And this has really big advantages because that's also the reason why many Japanese products are so customer-oriented because so many different people are talking about it and it's a very group-oriented product product in the end yeah but then again of course we have often more radical innovations or radically innovative product in western countries because there is one person having this crazy idea and then uh, believing in it forever and pushing it as long as needed yeah well, in that sense too it's interesting because if it, uh, the methodology of the innovation process is mm -hmm. very important if you have a group of japanese in a company and you start thinking about creative ideas. The, as you said before, the people sitting there going, uh, who's my senior in terms of when they join the company? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Who's male? Who's female? Who's uh, got a certain position, stank, status, rank in the company? And so a lot of people will hold themselves back in terms of putting out ideas because they, they feel it's not their position. Their senior should put up the idea. Mm -hmm. Whereas what you really want are the entirety of all possible ideas from that group. So the methodology of getting out ideas is very critical. Have you seen any particular methodologies well, that are very good at getting every idea well, out? Well, there is a difference between saying, okay, I'm contradicting my boss's ideas or my senpai's ideas, or I'm in a development team where we develop ideas. Yeah, Because, mm -hmm. of course, in a development team, the reason why you bring so very many people, different people in, is to get different perspectives. Of course, these perspectives are often communicated in a different way in Japan than they are in the West. In the West, it would be much more confrontational. So you would have five different people with five different opinions, and they would actually compare their opinions or basically throw their opinions at each other and discuss it like this. In Japan, there's often a merger of opinions. Yeah. And this is why the products are so customer oriented. But of course, if you are a Westerner and you are in a Japanese team and you are expecting, let's say, uh, I want the team to develop new sales ideas. Yeah. And nobody says anything. Huh? Because I'm just expecting everyone to come up and raise their hands saying, oh, I have this great idea, I know this, blah, blah, blah. This is not working here. Yeah? But one way to go is, for example, um, especially if you want teams to share opinions, is to say, okay, I, have, uh, I divide the whole team into people, into groups of two people each. I pose this question three weeks before the meeting or one week before the meeting, and I expect each team to come up with at least one idea. And then it's not presented as an individual, but as a group thing. And we can discuss or, uh, these ideas un without going into detail whose idea it was. Yeah? That's also one way to go. Mm -hmm. um, and there is also uh, one technique that works really well is uh, not brainstorming, where people actually say and things and things are written up somewhere. It's brainwriting. So people get post-its and everyone writes mm -hmm. an idea. And then mm -hmm. you just 
take these post-its and you don't know who's had which idea and you just discuss these ideas from there. Yeah. Yeah? So there are ways to do that. But that's again, as I said before, as an international manager, you need to figure out this kind of um, things or rules or activities and management processes on your own. And some things work better than others, but um, I think <laughs> that's the beauty of working overseas that you really improve your management skills by yeah. learning so many of these things. I remember yeah. my, my, my boss, he's passed away, unfortunately. Mm. Yeah, not, not long ago, he uh, he was ex-military, and we'd have all the heads. Uh, we'd go to an offsite, mm -hmm. and he'd be up there with his white whiteboard marker, and saying, you know, give me ideas, and he'd just crucify the ideas as they came up. You know, yeah. oh, we tried that, didn't work. That's a stupid idea. Give me another one. And it was just hopeless. You know, it was yeah. an absolutely hopeless mechanism mm -hmm. to do that. And I always thought to myself. Wow, this is not the way to do it. But this is, you know, this is obviously a very typical yeah. Western approach. Yes, yes, yes. And, and of course, in a Western context, you are raised, uh, uh, first of all, you learn to voice your opinion all the time, maybe too often, often. And uh, you're also used to getting, let's say, negative feedback or people saying, well, that's maybe not such a good idea. So, yeah. of course, not everyone can handle that in the West either, so yeah. that's for sure. But anyway, in Japan, that might not be the way people are socialized, but they can still have good ideas. I always tell people simply because you don't tell your opinion to everyone all the time doesn't mean you don't have an opinion. Yeah. yeah? yeah. So you can still have an opinion without uh, throwing it at everyone. <laughs> well, the other thing too is that, that type yeah. of uh, giving your ideas, yeah. usually the, the three people in the group who mm. are the most rowdy, most confident, will dominate yes, that of whiteboard. Course, yeah. And also... Yeah. The quick thinkers mm. will dominate that whiteboard, but the deeper thinkers won't. And the deepest, most probably valuable ideas are left in the room yeah. and they never come out. Yeah. So and you've needs, got to have a methodology of in tapping some into ways, that group. Yeah, and you need to be very sensitive about what you ask. Yeah? For example, one of the topics that is very important at the moment is diversity. Yeah? So uh, if I'm asked by a man, so w w what would you like to change here as a female work or employee, then I feel kind of, okay, well, if I tell you this, you may note it down, but you don't really understand what I'm talking about. Yeah. So these kind of things, of course, also play a, a very important role. It is, sensitivity is never wrong. Yeah. And my advice for everyone who is a foreign manager here is really ask questions in a neutral way and watch what works and doesn't. Yeah. And it's not um, always the best way to do things like they're done at home. And I think, um, yeah, that's really very important. At the end of the day, you want to achieve a result. Yeah. Hmm. What about trust? You know, one yeah. of the things here, um, Japan is often thought to be unemotional as a society. The Japanese are all very, you know, poker face and they don't show any emotion. But again, you can have emotions, but you don't constantly have to show them. <laughs> well, the thing this is... This is what I would say. Yeah. At some point you realize the whole country runs on emotion. And that emotion is based around an emotional idea of trust. And you'll find that people, you know, like when you're interviewing people, you've got mm. their resume, you know, why did you leave this company? Why did you mm. leave this company? And often they've been through many companies mm. uh, when the time they get to a foreign company. Oh, well, my senpai called me to quit this company and go here. And then that company went bust. And then something else happened over here. And it, like they're making these very emotional as opposed to logical decisions. And you're often surprised by that. Like, wow, okay. And often, too, um, that, that emotional uh, side of the trust equation is different to what it is in the West. So what have you found with dealing with getting trust in the Japanese work environment that's, say, different, how we get it well, in the West? Well, um, I think um, emotions are really a very important um, factor in the workplace everywhere. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So this is also a topic that now has entered also academic research, but um, it's something that is really, especially when you look at textbooks, American textbooks, never even occurring there. Of course, this is important, yeah? And we bring our emotions to the workplace. We are very strongly motivated or non-motivated by the workplace. So that's really important. But that's a that's a new thing. When yes. I when I was growing up, work, non-work was completely exactly, separate. Exactly. Yeah. Bosses mm -hmm. never asked you about your private life. In fact, they weren't allowed to ask you about yeah. your private mm -hmm. life. And no matter what problems you're having emotionally, no one cares. You get to the yeah. job site, get to work. I mean, you know? this is this is really very much depending on the company, and I guess it's also depending on the industry. But what is important is, of course, there are emotions, and they need to be taken care of. 
Huh? Hmm. Because the, the classic example of emotions turning against you is that you are in uh, a leader of a, uh, of a Japanese team and you behave as you behave and suddenly the team is gone. There are cases like this, yeah, where people chase away a whole team within a year yeah, after arriving in Japan because people are offended, they do not feel seen. Yeah? And nowadays the job situation in Japan, if you speak English and you have a special skill, you can find a job within a few weeks. So that's not really a, a problem. And that's the reason also why a lot of companies now start talking about cross-cultural management because these problems become more evident. But when we talk about trust, trust is a really interesting topic connected to emotions. But in a Western context, trust is basically developed between two people. And one way to develop it in a Western environment, or let's say one common way, is to communicate to learn about each other and mostly have similar opinions yeah mm. that's very important for us Western birds people. of a yeah? feather flock yes. together as we so say so basically yeah? we agree more with people who have similar opinions on major topics let's say politics or whatever yeah whereas in japan if you are in a classic japanese company environment you can enter as a kohai and you can basically expect to trust your senpai of course there's okay. always problems so kohai always, being the junior yes, senpai being the senior exactly right? the kohai is the junior and the senpai is the person that came to the company beforehand and this person is responsible for socializing you into the firm this person is responsible that's it and you can actually rely on that without even knowing this person beforehand and of course over time and this is also uh, very strong in Japan because the people spend a lot of time together. Yeah, they don't need to communicate everything or talk to each other about everything. They spend a lot of time together. They get to know each other because they are together. Trust gets deeper, but you can actually expect that. If you would be a newcomer in a Western firm and you would be, let's say, naive enough to trust everyone who's above you in the firm, people would just call you foolish. Yeah. So this trust uh, is, in fact, in a Western environment a piece of work and also a piece of management if you want to call it that whereas in japan it is in a classic japanese firm with a really reliable koi senpai koi system it's a given thing it gets deeper and better after a while because you really know my senpai is really caring for me and if my senpai tells me to work here i might try that because this person is reliable yeah? Mm. And it's also important to know this, especially as a Western manager or leader in Japan, because what I learned in Japan is, for example, my students would say, oh, I have these two job offers. Which one should I take? Yeah. That's a common question of students in Europe and here. In Europe, I would say, oh, I take this one because of here the reasons. And then the student would go home and decide something on his or her own. Yeah? That's totally fine. So I just give my opinion and that's it. In Japan, if I tell people, look, I think this is better for you because this industry is, let's say, more rewarding. This other industry is maybe dying. You should take this. They actually do it. I'll take yeah? advice. So yeah. I have to be much <laughs> more careful responsible. about what I say mm. because I know my voice or my opinion has plays a more important role than in, in, in the case of a Western student. Mm. Yeah? And this is, of course, also something that you need to know here as a leader in Japan. That's so how does, the, how does the new leader build that trust? You know, they can't read. They can't speak no, the language. You know? <laughs> well, they can't read Japanese. They're still human beings. <laughs> they can't yeah. read Japanese. They can't speak the language. <laughs> they don't know the culture. Mm -hmm. They turn up. They got to run the show. They're accountable. Mm -hmm. Headquarters have got expectations. How do they build yeah, trust in the team? It's very easy. We just talked about it. Basically, a Japanese team has a common goal to achieve whatever. Yeah? And if the team leader is a good team leader, the team leader is very dedicated to getting the team there. Yeah? And maybe not so dedicated in getting his or her career going. Yeah? Here, we, uh, here yeah. we hit the first so major problem, right? Yeah, th this is actually one thing you really have to communicate and say, look, this is about us. No? That's, the main, that's the main message. This is about us. I'm here to make sure we can achieve this. And we do this as a, as a, as a group, as a team, whatever. And um, if you say, look, I'm the team leader and I want you to do this, that's, of course, not the message that you motivate people here with. Yeah? Mm. It is really important to show people that you care. Mm. Yeah? And this care needs to be not only for each individual, as it would be in a Western team, but also for the group as a whole and making mm. sure that they can perform well and that they feel good and that they achieve goals. Yeah? And it is, um, it's not this difficult, really. Yeah? Uh? So, um, but uh, of course, 
coming from a very competitive, even aggressive Western system to a classic Japanese firm is a highly irritating experience at the beginning. For yeah. both sides. For both sides, yeah. yes. But I have to say, um, I always tell my, my students, my overseas students, if they can, they should take an internship or try to work in a Japanese company for a while uh, because this experience of being a real member of a group, yeah, like really having this trust towards uh, other people taking care of me or benef like basically yeah taking care of me or yeah believing that they will take care of me it's really a very very <laughs> fundamental experience if you are not socialized like this i mm. found i still find this very very interesting yeah and it is really something that we as westerners have not learned to do and that's 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 one of the very most interesting parts of working in Japan, I find. Yeah. What about, uh, you know, we talk a lot these days about culture and how have you seen uh, a good example of building culture in a Japanese organisation? You're coming in, you've got your headquarters culture, yeah. but then you're on the ground here and they're all Japanese. Mm -hmm. So you've got to build a, a different type of yeah. a culture. And I'm particularly not necessarily like, a Japanese culture, mm -hmm, like for example, mm -hmm, where yeah. Dale Carnegie. Yes, it started in 1912 in New York. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Dale Carnegie, he's mm -hmm. the man right here behind me, right? <laughs> but what we have here is a is a distinct culture mm -hmm. of our organisation, which we've created yeah. here. But what have you seen works well in creating a distinct well, culture in the company? In basically, Japan? I mean, this is this is a really important question because what what usually happens is that everyone in the firm, let's say it's a foreign subsidiary in Japan, it's a big company. Everyone in this company has a very different idea what this company is about and what the company culture is. Yeah. When I uh, do trainings in Tokyo, I have um, uh, usually the question is: Is this a European firm or is this a Japanese firm, American firm? And the Japanese will always say this is a Japanese firm, and the Westerners will say this is a from, from our home country. And there's never a difference. And mm -hmm. sometimes these people have worked together in the same room for 10 years and they still have a completely different view about what the culture of this company is. So the best way to do this is to define the leadership or the basically the company culture. And this is a leadership job. This is a job that so far, I have to say, I've never really seen here. <laughs> yeah? Because most people think that it's very obvious. They can't see this need. And they often cannot see um, that culture is a little bit more than eating sushi or something else or the way we, we run a meeting. Uh, this needs to be defined beforehand. No? Saying, okay, look, this is a company where people have their own responsibility, but we still have a team responsibility. Something, this, these kind of things need to be defined very clearly. They need to be pictured. They need to be trained to make sure people understand that. And this needs to be done at the beginning, not 10 years later. Yeah? And um, this is very difficult to change once people have worked for many years in a firm and realize that these cultural expectations they have do not fit and create conflict and this is a, this is actually what costs money yeah but generally the best way to go would be defining a special corporate culture for this subsidiary in Japan for example or for the Japanese subsidiary overseas communicate it to people and make sure they know about this yeah and then you can take it from there there's still going to be enough problems on top of that but if people just define their own culture in their heads and they do then it's always going to be, I, I mean, I cannot read everyone's mind. What expectations do you have towards what, what does this person have? So you need to kind of manage these expectations before or at the beginning. Yeah. And that makes it a lot easier. Mm. Usually the expectations are not managed. Or at least I haven't seen a case. Yeah. And that is uh, inspiring in the best, <laughs> in the best case scenario or the best case but mostly it's also frustrating because um, we don't really talk about expectations they're quite clear to us yeah, to each person but not to the other person no? mm. what about how would you define leadership then well leadership the classic definition would be that you are uh, you have the authority or power to change people's behavior to achieve a corporate goal in a mm -hmm. corporate sense, yeah? This could also be a, a, a family goal, for example. I want to make sure my kids behave properly and uh, do not uh, get into an accident so I can change their behavior when they cross the streets for someone, yeah? But basically the idea is, of course, 
as a Western leader, the idea is to change people's behavior, have this power, and make sure the company goal is managed. Yeah, I think from a Japanese perspective, this is more like a, a parent-like role. Yeah, and I'm not saying a mother or father role, but it's more like a parent. A parent, yeah, like a parent, yeah. You are in some ways also an emotional caretaker of everyone, like a family, mm-hmm. yeah. And uh, you want this family, this group to succeed. You want these family members to be happy. But of course, since there are a lot of people involved, not everyone can be happy at the same time. But the overall idea is to keep everyone striving something, mm-hmm. yeah. Whereas in the West, of course, the focus would basically be on profit goals western leadership styles have uh, the discussion about western leadership has really moved in the past 20 years from achieving goals to also being let's say um, a leader that can support people emotionally or um, being a people-oriented person something like that that's also very um, very it's a big Common change. Now. Big yeah. change, isn't it? Yeah. If we're going to give some, or if you're going to give some advice to someone, they're arriving in Japan, they've mm-hmm. been sent out mm-hmm. here, to run the organisation. Yeah. What would be a couple of pieces of immediate advice you'd give them? Yeah, I mean, basically, as I said before, you need to analyse yourself, which isn't very easy. Yeah, usually you find out how you tick <laughs> once you run into a problem, <laughs> and that's that's a that's a good thing because uh, you realise, okay, I'm doing things differently. It doesn't work here the way I like it or the way I do it. The problem is that this learning process is rather stressful, so you learn by mistakes, and which is quite annoying, especially in the first few years. So one thing I would do is really. Um, Basically, prepare, read about it, that's one thing. And then once you are in the company, um, ask as many questions as possible. Yeah. And of course, there are things that can be changed that might be better for everyone. Yeah. And then there are things that should not be changed that might be um, better done or it's better to do them the Japanese way. And this is, of course, also something a good leader would have to find out. Yeah. But um, I would definitely say what, what I did in the first years when I came to Japan, I talked a lot to people who have been uh, working here for a long time and who have been successful. I mean, what is the danger here is that things get too overwhelming or too, too stressful and then people just shut up and, and say, okay, uh, I have my opinion. I'm going to, I don't know, my home country community here in Tokyo, my club. And uh, I just gossip about the things that happen at work in Japan, which is not the right way to go. Yeah, mm-hmm. but it needs a certain openness and also a certain stress resistance. You know, resistance. Mm-hmm. I mean, people really, as I said before, do underestimate how stressful it can be to work overseas. That's a topic that even literature doesn't, uh, scientific literature doesn't. Uh, take into consideration. There's always this talk about, I don't know, Hofstede and cultural clusters and this culture's like this and this culture's like that. But at the end of the day, as a manager, you need to work in this culture. You have to take risks. You have to achieve goals. This is really difficult. Yeah? And no one gives advice <laughs> on how to do that. That's making it much more uh, challenging than most people believe. Yeah? And I think reflecting on your own, on, uh, reflecting, self-reflection is the most important thing, which is very difficult. And then then really be open to change and say, okay, I have to change my ways here. I have to talk to people differently. I have to learn how to behave in a different way if I want to be successful in this environment. Yeah. Mm. Well, great. Thank you very much, Bruce. This has been <laughs> fantastic because <laughs> you. You know, it's an unusual chance to have someone who studies leadership in Japan talk about mm. that. And also you're drawing on thousands of companies' experiences, whereas most of us only have the experience of our own company. And maybe a few conversations at the Tokyo American Club over lunch with some uh, other leaders, yes. you know, type of thing. But this is great because your pool of knowledge and resource is much vaster than anything that we're ever going to come up with. So yeah. thank you for that. But it's, it's, it's very human to be like this. I mean, if you are in a company and this is your job, this is your life, yeah, you don't want to risk anything. You have to achieve certain goals and things become difficult, then of course you're very concerned, yeah. I forgot to ask you, should they learn Japanese? Well, it's always a good idea to learn Japanese. I've been doing it for 30 years now and I'm still <laughs> I'm still learning. I, I wish I would speak more Japanese, but I read a lot in Japanese and I really enjoy this, yeah. But yes, it is helpful and um, but that... 
Japanese is definitely not a language you learn on the side in two or three years. People who like difficult languages, good choice. That's yeah. what you said at the beginning. <laughs> well, I, I, I'm I always trying to avoid me. difficult languages, but uh, yeah. I went up here anyway. Yeah, I, I think this is going to be my hobby for the rest of my life. And I still nice. enjoy it. Nice. Yeah. Well, but I have to say it was a lot easier to do when I was 19. Now I'm <laughs> 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 I really have to study, which is, uh, yeah. It's hard. <laughs> Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Thank it was you. a pleasure to talk to you. And please join us again for our next episode of Japan's top business interviews. <laughs>